All right, so we are in a, a short series that we've named The Cost of Calling, and uh, we're looking at the life of David and how he goes through this process of anointing to authority. Now, last week, Brandon kicked us off by showing us the moment in 1 Samuel 16 where Samuel anointed David. And from there begins this 15-year process of gaining the authority to properly wear the crown um, as he becomes king. And so uh, my hope is to convey to you all that this is a common process. The, the process he went through is a common process. Last week, we learned that we are all called, that we all have an assignment, right? And that, that we all um, have been uh, given an anointing from the Holy One, the Bible says. But what I, what I also want you to understand is that anointing and authority is not the same thing. Okay. Anointing and authority is not the same thing. We've all experienced this dynamic, right? Where someone that we know, uh, that we work with, maybe a peer, uh, someone who's really not even that good of an employee gets promoted to management. Have you, have you ever been a part of that? Right, that, that all at the same time, this person is anointed, uh, given an assignment and handed authority, right? And the hot mess that ensues from that moment is predictable. Why? Because anointing is not the same thing as authority. Oh, oh yeah, we can give you a title. We can give you a title, right? But if you don't go through this process, if you don't go through the process like David had to go through, and as I'm going to show you today, that Saul refused to go through. If you don't go through this process, you are in danger of severely hurting yourself and hurting those who you've been put uh, in, in authority over. Amen? And so uh, Gene Edwards is uh, an American house church planner, a Christian author, and evangelist. And he wrote this uh, book called A Tale of Three Kings. A Tale of Three Kings. And it's this dramatization and retelling of the stories of Saul, David, and Absalom. And, and the book is a modern classic because Edwards frames it as a study in brokenness. As you study the lives of King Saul and King David and Absalom from 1 Samuel chapter 9 all the way through the end of 2 Samuel, and you witness each of their ascensions from their upbringings to their installments as king, uh, all the way up to their, their ups and downs uh, in ruling a nation, uh, you learn a lot about uh, their leadership. You learn about what people do when they're in power, right? You're able to compare and contrast the character of, uh, of King uh, Saul and King David and all the decisions they made throughout the reign. But in this book, Edwards, uh, he asks a question that will burn you to your soul if you let it, okay? Uh, he, and, and I believe this question is the basis of this whole series, Okay, so this is what he asked. When, when comparing King Saul and King David, he asked this question. He says, what does this world need? Huh? Gifted men outwardly empowered or broken men inwardly transformed? What does this world need? Huh? See, when, when God anoints you and gives you an assignment, he does not enroll you in the school of do nothing. I assure you that if on that day that David got anointed, if he just went back to the pasture and waited out his time until he became king, he never would have become king. It would have never happened. Right? It would have never happened. And this is the reason why homeboy at work fails in his new management position. Why? Because he thinks it's an occasion for him to sit back, kick his feet up, and tell other people what to do. And this is why there are many believers who are nominal and don't experience victory in their lives. It's because we think that an encounter with God is an occasion for us to sit back and chill. But in reality, when God anoints you, listen, when God anoints you, he does not enroll you in the school of do nothing. No, he enrolls you in the school of brokenness. Y'all looking a little gloomy today. Can you just smile at me maybe a little bit just so I know you're not mad at me? See, in between this process of anointing and authority is another A word. You know what that word is? It's adversity. David would eventually find himself fighting a giant that not even the greatest warriors in all of Israel wanted to fight. Uh, he would find himself running from Saul and trying to convert a cave into a palace as he's leading hundreds of people who come that he has to lead. Uh, David would find himself trying to keep his heart right and doing all he can to hold on to the promises of God as he sees his, his wives and children taken away as Ziklag. And so it's really important to note when you think of David and you think of David as king, please understand that David went through a process before that crown was put on his head. 
he went through a process. So it gives me, it gives me no joy to say this because it really stinks when you're going through it. Uh, but God uses broken vessels. God uses broken vessels. He wants men and women who know pain and can thrive anyway. All right, that's what God's looking for. Uh, Edwards in this book goes on to say this. He says, God has his school because he does not have broken men and women. Instead, he has several other types of people. He has people who claim to have God's authority and don't. People uh, who claim to be broken and aren't. Uh, and he has, regretfully, a great mixture of everything in between. All of these he has in abundance, but broken men and women, hardly at all. And so if you want to go from anointing to authority, you are going to have to enroll in and graduate from the school of brokenness. You must become the type of person, listen, you must become the type of person who can live in pain and honor God in it so that it produces an authenticity in you so that it enables you to handle authority when it's handed to you. Are you, are you hearing me? I'm not going to go this whole service with y'all just looking all. Uh, Re-listen to it later. All right, so Brandon, he's going to uh, finish this short series uh, next week by showing you how authority was won in David's life. But my task is to show you how Saul failed in this process. All right, so since last week we looked at the anointing of David, uh, what I want to do today is I want to show you how Saul's flunking in the school of brokenness necessitates David's needing to be anointed. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. All right, so we're introduced to uh, Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 9, and almost immediately we see why he was such a good candidate to be king. Because the Bible says that Saul was as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. All right, physically, externally, he looked the part. Right? And everything started out well for him because before he was installed as a king, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He's prophesying with the prophets. It even says that, uh, that, that God changed his heart. Yet with all of this being the case, over time, his character flaws led to his downfall. And so there's two instances that revealed Saul's internal heart posture. There are two tests, two ways that he flunked the school of brokenness. So the first comes in 1 Samuel 13. Now, in this passage, Saul attacks a Philistine outpost, and in retaliation, they assemble a massive army. And this, this army is so massive that uh, many of the Israelites cower in fear. Many of them start to flee the country. Many of them begin to hide in caves and in pits and in cisterns. But Saul is told to wait for Samuel before offering sacrifices to God. Uh, and so before initiating a battle with the Philistines, he has to wait for Samuel. All right, but this is what he does. Okay, so First Samuel 13, starting in verse 7. It says, Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. And just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I've not sought out the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Here's Samuel. You've done a foolish thing. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God that he gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. See, it's one thing to say that you trust the Lord, but it's another thing entirely when you're put in a position when you have to. Amen. And so when put under pressure, when facing adversity, Saul goes into self-preservation mode. He disobeys God's command and then he justifies it. Now, maybe you think it's not that big of a deal. 
right? I mean, you think, man, that was, oh, man, that wasn't, it? but it was such a deal breaker to God that God looks at the circumstance. And he says, hey, you don't have the heart for this. I'm, I'm moving on. I'm getting someone else. And so the second test, that's the first test. The second test comes in 1 Samuel 15. Now, this scenario is a bit different. It's not the same. All right. uh, Israel is not the underdog in this battle. They are in this battle. They are in a position of strength. God tells Saul to go and fight against the Amalekites, and he instructs him to completely destroy uh, them and all that belongs to them. Right now, now just so there's no controversy, I, I researched the Hebrew word all. Do you know what all means in Hebrew? All. Wow. You got the theologians all across the room. This is great. This is great. Okay. All. That's what he says. Okay. But look what he does. First Samuel 15, starting in verse seven. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and he went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. Uh, there he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, and this, I love this because it sounds like my grandma's voice to me. Samuel says, what then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Oh, this is bad. <laughs> Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and, you, and sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, to, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, and you've, you've been in church for years. You've heard this over and over again. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? And say this with me. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now again, Saul disobeys God's command and justifies it. All right, and so what we see in these two tests is that in adversity, Saul goes into self-preservation mode, and in prosperity, Saul goes into self-exaltation mode. Okay, This is why there's such a contrast between King Saul and King David. See, King Saul was rejected by God, while David is described as a man after God's own heart. Right? And the reason why is because David was, ex he was accepted because he was broken. Saul was rejected because he wouldn't break. When adversity and prosperity revealed his heart, he doubled down on his rebellion. Now, let's take this information and make it practical, okay? Because we understand that Saul was broken. Well, we understand that. But it doesn't really help us any unless we use it as a means to identify our own brokenness. Amen? And so someone said this to me recently, um, and man, it hurt when he said it. Um, so, so this will either heal you or torment you, but you get to decide what happens with it. Okay. This is what he said. He said, you know, in the stories that we tell about ourselves, we are almost always the hero or the victim, never the villain. I'll say that again. In the stories we tell about ourselves, we are almost always the hero or the victim, never the villain. If you and I are going to graduate from the school of brokenness, if we're going to graduate, 
We have to have a spiritual self-awareness that acknowledges our flaws and our failures and we bring it to God so that he can repair us. All right. Now, when I was a kid, storytelling time. When I was a kid, um, I, um, I lived in a very bad area of one of the best cities in the world. All right, so I was born in San Francisco, but I was raised in the Fillmore District. And um, I lived in a, a low-income apartment with my, my uncle, my aunt, and my cousins. Um, and in our house, we had ro- in our apartment, we had roaches, right? Now, that wasn't a surprise to me. But what was a surprise to me is when I would see many of them all at the same time. Okay, it freaked me out, all right? And so one day uh, in particular, I remember I ran into the kitchen. I flipped the light switch on really, really quick. And there were roaches everywhere. And then they scattered and they all went and they hid. And so later on, as I was looking back on it, I realized that the suddenness of turning the light on didn't create the roaches. It only prevented them from hiding. Do you understand? The, the turning on the light suddenly, it didn't, it didn't create the roaches. The roaches didn't come because the light came on. It just kept them from being able to hide. They were always there. They were always there. All right, now let me give you an example in your life. Uh, I used this example on some of my friends a couple weeks ago. It's a, it's a good one. Okay, so if you're driving, if you're driving and someone cuts you off and you proceed to curse them out, it's not the provocation that caused you to freak out. You know what I'm like, like maybe you would say, I was provoked. That's not really me. I'm not really like that. It was the other driver. But what I would say to you is, yes, it is you. You are that angry. You just never have enough pressure on you to bring it out. Oh, now you're talking to me. I got to get in your business for you to talk. All right, the light certainly suddenly got turned on and all the roaches were revealed. That's what happens. So we are all blind to our flaws and brokenness. Call, call them roaches, if you will. All right, call them roaches. And every now and then, by the mercy of God, he quickly turns on a light. He turns the light on suddenly. And the turning on of the light suddenly comes primarily in two ways. Okay. It comes by way of adversity and it comes by way of prosperity. All right. These are two equal crises, by the way. All right. Both of them will bring out the worst in you, revealing your roaches. All right. Now, as I was thinking about this, I got a picture and this is how I think about it. So what is in you comes out of you when you're in adverse circumstances. Okay. So when you're, when you're squeezed, okay. Think about a sponge. When you squeeze a sponge, the water comes out. All right. And what's in you comes out of you when you're filled to overflow, when you prosper. All right. Think about a cup that you turn the water on and it fills up and then it overflows and the water comes out. Okay. And so to say it plainly, circumstances don't tell you who you are. No, no, no. Circumstances reveal who you are. They reveal who you are. You can clap. I mean, you can do it halfway or a little bit. Thanks, brother in the back. I, I, I appreciate your support. All right, so let me give you some, some practical tools here. All right, now that I've made a mess of things, I've revealed your roaches. Okay. All right, let me see if I can help you. All right. So if it's true that God has enrolled us all in the school of brokenness and that God is committed to showing us where we are broken as a means to create humility in us and an authenticity in us uh, and, and as a means to, uh, to create a reliance on him, if, if that's true, that God is doing all those things, then what do we do when adversity and prosperity reveals our flaws and failures? All right, what do we do? Okay, three things and then we'll finish. The first thing. Number one, don't waste your sorrows. Don't waste your sorrows. You know, as a child of God, there is nothing that happens to you that God can't use to make you great. Did you hear that? There is nothing, nothing that happens to you that God can't use to make you great. 
right? He works all things, the Bible says, he works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know, I looked up the Greek word for all. <laughs> and you know what the Greek word for all, you know what all means in the Greek? All. 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 Don't waste your sorrows means that we must not self-preserve in adversity or self-exalt in prosperity, but instead lean into what God is showing you and telling you. You know, in the last year and a half, man, uh, we have all experienced either adversity or prosperity. Very few people were neutrally impacted. We've all been there. And so I've said this before, but I think it's, re- it's worth repeating. If, if you are coming out of the last year and a half, if you're coming out of this season and you've not repented of something, or you have not strengthened your relationship with the Lord, you have absolutely missed what the season was about. You've missed it. Don't waste God's merciful attempt to grow you up in him. Don't waste it. Okay, so number one, don't waste your sorrows. Number two, do the heart work now. All right, do the heart work now. Christ-likeness is won or lost every day in the small successes and small failures. There is no winter break or summer break in the school of brokenness. Every day you're going to class. Every day you're turning assignments in. And if you can just master the day-to-day discipline, if you can just master the, the lessons that come before you every day, then the major tests of adversity and prosperity, when they come into your life, you can pass. You can pass. All right, so do the hard work. All right, when, when your life isn't spilling over, right? I think it was Oprah Winfrey who said, money just makes you more of what you were before you had it, right? That, that when, when you prosper, uh, there's a spiritual danger to you. And when you go through adverse situations, it's a spiritual danger to you. But if every day you accept this invitation from the Lord to walk with him through the minors of it, when the majors come, it's not so hard. Amen. And so number one, do not waste your sorrows. Number two, do the hard work now. And lastly, number three. Thanks, brother. Number three, believe in the gospel of Jesus. Believe in the gospel of Jesus. Amen. That point will stand by itself. Believe in the gospel of Jesus. See, many Christians believe that the gospel is this one-time transaction. Don't we? It's this one-time event, right? Like it's, it, it's, it's this thing that you, you have an encounter with God once and everything is done. That's what we think. We, we, we think of the gospel as the gospel, right? That you take it once and you recover. But what I would say to you, is that God is committed to every day driving the truth of what his son has done for you into your heart. Every day he's trying to drive it like a nail into your heart. And what's the truth? The truth is that the cross is the ultimate picture of adversity that created an unimaginable prosperity for us. That's the truth. Jesus, the king of heaven, had everything. Yet the Bible says that he emptied himself. He had everything, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself by becoming a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. And finding himself in the likeness of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus, though he was rich, though he was prosperous, he did not self-exalt in that circumstance. You know what he did? No, he leveraged his wealth and reputation to save us. That's what he did. And though Jesus was prosperous, though we see what he did with his prosperity, don't miss what he had to do in his adversity on the way to authority. And I I saw this this week, man, and it it cut me. Okay, so so listen to me on this. There are 1,800 uh, verses of Jesus Christ's actual words, or his quotes. Okay, 1,800 verses. Uh, verses. And of those 1,800 verses, 180 of them are Jesus quoting scripture. Okay. So 10% of Jesus's recorded words are Jesus saying what the Bible already says. 
Okay, 10% of what he says. And so he's constantly telling people, you know, what to do using the word. He's constantly pointing people back to scripture. But I want you to look at what happens to him when life goes off the rails for him. Because when he was being captured in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter pulls out a sword and he tries to fight. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, put your sword away. Don't you know that I can have 12 legions of angels come down right now and shut this down? But how else will the scriptures be fulfilled? In Luke 23, Jesus is carrying his cross. He's headed to the cross and he's walking, right? Literally on his way to be executed. He's carrying his cross and he sees the daughters of Jerusalem. And you know what he does? He quotes the book of Hosea to them. In John chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus is hanging on the cross, dying for you and me. And then it says this, it says, so that the scriptures will be fulfilled. Jesus said, I thirst. No one can hear him. Who's he talking to? Matthew 27, 46, Jesus yells out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. So listen, listen, here's the point. Why is he doing this? You know what? We want to know why he's doing this. Because Jesus didn't just use scripture to help other people to do the right thing. Jesus used scripture to get himself to do the right thing. He was scripture. It was so in him that when he was squeezed, it came out. It came out. Jesus enrolled in and graduated from the school of brokenness for you. Jesus was broken so that you could be healed. Jesus took on the worst of circumstances so that you would never have to be alone in yours. And he is here right now. He's here right now to save and to heal. Amen. Will you stand with me? See, Saul couldn't see his roaches. Saul wouldn't break. Saul was outwardly empowered, but was not inwardly transformed, and it cost him everything. So the question is, how about you? If you're here today, with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if you're here today and you would say, Sean, this message was for me. Sean, I do not have a relationship with Jesus, but I know I need one. And this idea of brokenness, I know what brokenness is. I know what that feels like. And I need to be restored. I need to be healed today. If you would say that, just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you, okay? I just want to pray for you. I see you, brother. I see you, sis. Right there, right there. Amen. I see you, sister. Seven or eight hands have gone up. I see you in the back. Nine, ten. Thanks, sis. Anyone else? I'll wait. On a day like today, on a special day like today, if there's spiritual births taking place, we'll wait. Because there are angels in heaven that would love to sing happy birthday. This is my last call. I see you, sister. I see you in the front. I see you, brother. Oh, my God. Anyone else? If you're here today and you would say, Sean, I am a believer, but man, I'm off track. 
that, that going through adversity, uh, and I love how Aaron said it today, man, I've been focusing on my enemy across the table and not on the provision right in front of me. And I got to get back. That if, if in fact there is this process from anointing to authority and I'm stuck in adversity, I just need Jesus right now to come into my life and just heal me afresh, change me afresh. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Amen. I see you all across the room. I see you guys. Oh, man. Man. Listen, guys, if, if you will not own your brokenness and if you will not live from that place, you can never have the authority <laughs> that produces the flourishing in your life and in other people's lives that God so desires. Amen. You were not your adversity. You were not your prosperity. You were not your failure and you're not your success, right? So don't believe the hype. Don't believe the horror. Believe in Jesus, okay? Amen. And so we're just gonna pray. And I would just ask us to do a bold thing today. We don't always do this on Sunday. So if our prayer team can come forward, if you guys should just come forward. We had many hands that came up. If you're here today, and you were, you were so bold to raise your hand and say, Sean, yes, I need a spiritual rebirth. I need Jesus. And you raise your hand. If, if you're bold enough to come out and partner with these, these are safe people in the front. I know them all. They're safe. If you will come and pray with them, um, they will partner with you in this process. Amen. So just please just come forward. We just want to pray with you. And I'll pray for the rest of the house. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you use brokenness in my life as a means. Uh, hmm, as a means to take me through a process so that you can use me. And I thank you that all across the room, everyone in here, we are broken in many ways. But God, you, you have a way of, of taking our lives like, like in your word, you say that, God, you use all things. And that, that language there is like a tapestry that things don't start off great. They don't start off well. They don't start off right. But you have a way of weaving all the things in our lives and making this beautiful tapestry. And so, God, we say yes to the invitation to you to enroll in the school of brokenness, knowing, God, that you won't break us by means of just to break us. God, you will break us to make us whole. And so we thank you for that. I thank you for everyone who raised their hands today, everyone who said yes to you. Lord, would you do what you intend to do in their hearts right now? God, would you save souls in this place? By your Holy Spirit, by your Holy Spirit, come and flow into their hearts so that their spirits testify that there is a God. We thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.